Welcome to Make Your Mark podcast, where guests share their experiences, insights, and tactics to help you accelerate your business. So building, scaling, and monetizing your business is made easier. And I will be your host, Kay Suthar. Hey guys, oh my goodness. Welcome back to another episode of Make Your Mark podcast. I have got an Awesome, awesome guest for you today. I'm super, super excited. Such a bubbly personality, so colorful, so much information, knowledge. Oh my goodness, I cannot wait for this episode. Now, after spending many years in corporate America, Lorraine said goodbye to bureaucracy, right? The glass ceilings and bad coffee to follow her passion to help small business owners succeed. Now, today, This successful entrepreneur, author, and professional speaker enjoys sharing what she knows about marketing in presentations to groups all around the world, in colleges and classrooms, and on her weekly podcast called More Than Few Words. She brings creative ideas, practical tips, and decades of real-world experience to every conversation. And in her spare time, she loves to travel, and take photos. Oh my goodness. So her social media is going to be packed full of photos. Go and check them out, guys. Please welcome to the stage, Lorraine. Oh my goodness. It's so awesome to have you here, Lorraine. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for the event, uh, the invitation. (laughs) No worries. Now we had a little bit of a conversation off camera Mm -hmm. and I love your personality already. (laughs) right? (laughs) Like you're ready to rock and roll, you're bubbly, you've got so much information, you've been doing this for a while, and you've been a podcaster for 13 years, Mm -hmm. right? Way before people even heard about what podcast was, which is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it was so funny because I really didn't know what podcasts were. And I had an (laughs) intern who came to me and he said, you should do a podcast. You know, and I was running a marketing agency at the time. And he said, you should do a podcast. And I went, okay, I don't know what that means. And I don't know how it works. You <laughs> set it up and we'll figure it out. And 13 years later, we're st- I'm still doing it. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I've got to ask this question, Lorraine, right? Starting a podcast 13 years ago where it wasn't really known, people weren't doing it, and an intern came up to you and told you this is what you need to be doing. Why would you decide, yeah, this is what I should be doing when no one else was doing it? You know, I have spent so much and in in corporate, I definitely did that, which is one of the reasons why I didn't stay in corporate. Mm -hmm. Um, But I spent my whole, uh, my whole career going, okay, well, that's sort of interesting. I wonder how that's going to work. And I love the idea of skunk works. You know, you have your core business. I mean, I was running a, a marketing agency. I have my core business and you have this opportunity over here and you're like, you know what? We could play with that. It, it's it, it's a small investment. Right. It has potential, and if the whole thing blows up, okay. Um, the opportunity, and I loved having interns in the agency because it would be something you could. They would find a project that they were excited about, mm, right? And they would throw themselves into it. And it did not distract my core team from taking care of our clients and doing what we did. And we had some glorious failures and some wonderful things that came out of it. And the um, the podcast was definitely one. We had some ups and downs. We experimented with different platforms over the years and settled into the format that I have now. But learned a lot along the way and had a lot of fun. And it all started because somebody else who knew me said, you like to talk. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so you've already said, you mentioned that there's been some failures, some ups and downs. What kind of things did you notice where that didn't work regards to the podcast? And I know we're going off track a little bit here, (laughs) um, but... I love podcasts. You know, I love podcasts. You, you're a podcaster as well, and you've been doing it for a while. So, what were some of the things that you noticed worked and didn't work in podcasting? So, um, <laughs> oh my god, when we first started, now thirteen years ago, podcasting was was very new, and people were treating it, and I was treating it like an extension. Of, it was more online radio, an extension of radio rather than its own being. So we looked to radio to model 
How do we do this? And one of the things that was really popular at the time was call-in radio. Ah, okay. So we were using a platform called Blog Talk Radio, and we did a call-in podcast. Oh. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Let me say, not necessarily great, because... You know, radio stations have got an army of people that are answering the phones and sort of filtering this. And I just picked up the phone when it rang, you know. Uh, so, oh, my God, we we had some very strange conversations. <laughs> um, we. Uh, uh, that was that was part of it. The other thing we did that really did work that I had to give up when I when I stopped the live show was the live Twitter feed. So. I had one of my interns, again, interns, loved interns, loved, (laughs) loved the enthusiasm. She was really good on Twitter. She was snappy. She was funny. She was sitting there. I was interviewing the guest and she was live tweeting. And so we had, we really left. So that worked wonderfully. We lost that when we, we lost the, when we walked away from the live shows, but also Twitter today is not. It, 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 okay, we're not even, I'm not going to get into a conversation about what happened to my favorite social media platform because it's not my same favorite social media platform anymore. Um, but one of the, the, the good things was we looked around at the tools, the lesson, the tools that were available at the time and said, how can we use this? Call in, bad. Live Twitter, good. Right. You know, and kind of learned from it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I think, again, Twitter is one of those platforms that not many people were using or didn't know how to use, right? Like Facebook, Instagram, that was one of the biggest things around. And I know we're not going to go down there in regards to Twitter, but Twitter has changed so much, especially (laughs) recently, right? Um, I'm not really big on Twitter, but what are your thoughts on what's happened recently around that? So I'm going to go back and correct you just a smidge to something you said. Twitter wasn't big and Facebook was. I'm old enough and I've been on Twitter long enough that when I first started using it, if you remember, Facebook was rolled out as a college platform. It was not available if you did not have a university ID. Ah, okay. The second thing about Facebook was even when it opened up before they acquired Instagram, when it first opened up, Facebook was what I would call a dorm room toy. Right. You got on Facebook, you found out where your friends were, and then you closed Facebook and you went off to find your friends. Right. It was not originally a mobile app, Uh. not in its early iterations. So yes, they got into mobile, but it really wasn't great. If you wanted instant, hey, I'm here at the bar, anybody downtown, that was Twitter. But it sounds like Tinder. (laughs) No, no, because, okay, so we used it. We used it. um, I was on the board of a theater festival for a number of Mm -hmm. years. And so we created a hashtag that all of my army of reviewers and, and fans of the festival we're on. It would be like, hey, I'm going to see this show at 10 o'clock. Be there. Oh, my God. Here's a photo of me with the magician. I just got out of her show. Put it on your schedule. So it wasn't really a dating app. It was really a conversation. People really talked to each other. Mm. Um, and I wrote a whole article on this, so I'm going to rant for just a second. No worries. <laughs> As the platforms matured, they copied from each other. You right. know, they tried to figure out, oh, they're doing this well, I'll do this. So after a while, the platforms all kind of blurred. Twitter did not have a like button. Mm-hmm. Twitter was reply, retweet, or you could star if it was your favorite. But people didn't really star. So on Twitter, If you said something and I thought it was cool, I just retweeted it. I didn't have to put a comment. I just reshared it. But what it meant was conversations moved very quickly and you got a chance to see a lot of people. 
And you did things called the Follow Friday. So I could introduce, hey, these are 10 people I think are really interesting. And and, and it grew. When they introduced the like button, because they were copying Facebook and LinkedIn, it absolutely killed the retweet. Right. Because now I could go through and just mindlessly like. And none of my friends or followers saw what I was thinking was interesting. And it changed. That was one of the first changes. And it really, wow. not in a good way, mm-hmm. not in a good way. Wow. Um, the second thing was, oh, but you could do these longer posts on Facebook and you could do longer posts. Yep. Twitter was about being snappy. It was about mm-hmm. being concise. Yeah. And then we're not even going to talk about where it is. It's just, it's just a cluster. <laughs> it's, it's not fun. And so as the other platforms improved and Twitter didn't, people left the platform. More and more of my friends, um, I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. I think I've, I've found a place for it now in my, in my life and in my business. Um, the other thing Facebook, you're going to laugh, was not good at. Uploading mobile photographs to Facebook was a horrible experience. Oh, interesting. I don't remember that. Yeah, well, <laughs> then they bought, okay, then they bought Instagram. Ah. Okay. And they took the technology of Instagram. In the early days, when you uploaded photos to Instagram, you could share them to Twitter or Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore yeah so that's um that you know that was uh so so all of those things really changed the platform twitter was a great place to have conversations with your customers so let's kind of come full circle because originally i stumbled on it for business and yeah. um if you were happy or unhappy and you were in a business you got on twitter mm. Right. And you got immediate. There was, I used to teach a course in um, uh, social customer service and um, talking about what it meant to really be on social media, providing customer service and what the costs were and kind of watched as companies did it and then realized it was really expensive and then stopped doing it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Do you know what, what the, the most powerful thing that I'm hearing right now is, You've seen the evolution, right, of <laughs> social media, right, of podcasting. Like, you've done so much. So much has changed. And the fact that you've been able to keep up with it, Lorraine. Right? And not a lot of people can do that. And they're not able to pivot. And we've seen a lot of that during the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but with the whole change, especially with technology, and it's come so far, right, you've been able to keep up with it. One of the questions I would love to ask you is, with what you've experienced in your journey, right? What were, well, what was your journey? What did it look <laughs> like back then, mm. right? And how did you get to this point? Because a lot of people think it happens in the click of a finger and we all know it doesn't. No, I, um, well, okay. I started, um, I started in corporate. I started in a marketing department. I have, and I will tell you the, the under, the, the two things that are, under everything that I've done, number one, no matter what I'm doing, marketing principles apply. The basics of marketing, no matter what the tools are, you know, um, this week it's it's TikTok or it's Threads or it's Twitter or or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. All of that, ChatGPT. Okay, oh. all of, okay, okay <laughs> pal. I, I'll tell you, we, if we get to that, I'll tell you my love hate with ChatGPT. But what, whatever it is, there. All of those are just tools that you're laying on top of the marketing platform. And so you got to know your basics. Go back to school, take a course, read a book. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, in my journey, so I started in corporate and had bosses that would let me do like I did with my intern, Scott Quirks. I had my regular job, but I was always reading or looking at things going, hey, you know, this is this is cool. Has anybody looked at that? Mm-hmm. And 
I was really fortunate that I had some bosses who said, you know, nobody else is doing that. Why don't, why don't you check it out? Um, and you're going to laugh at when I tell you what one of my first, you know, have, have we thought about this moments? So I was on a marketing team and um, we were getting ready for our annual sales meeting. Thousand people, we, we put on a show. Mm-hmm. And back then you created your slides and you sent them to a production company that created glass slides that sat in a, in a carousel. Because when you were projecting on a screen for a room of a thousand people, you needed really, really high quality images. Mm-hmm. And so you, you you created these trays of glass slides and they were gorgeous. And I was like, you know, we're, we're using PowerPoint now. We're not using the secretaries designing them anymore. We're using PowerPoint to create these. Have you thought about just projecting the PowerPoint? And everybody went, yeah, no. Well, somebody dropped a tray of those glass slides Ooh. belonging to the um, uh, one of the vice presidents. Uh-oh. And at 11 o'clock at night, the guy running the conference is running to my room going, you know how to use PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And, and you can show me how to project that onto the main screen, right? Yeah. Do and overnight, our sales team we changed how we did conferences. Wow! Because so, but it was because I was playing on the side trying to figure that out, and so I did corporate. I um, I had a love hate relationship with corporate. I had a lot of fun. I cannot say it was a terrible experience because um, I was hired because I was a little bit out of the box and all I had to do was remind people that you hired me. Right. Right. You know, this is, this is, you know, I I showed up for the interview in a purple suit and orange shirt and four inch purple heels. And you (laughs) said, here's your contract. So, you know, if that was our starting point, why are you thinking this is crazy? Right. What happens in corporations and what happened to me was the people that originally hired me, everybody, you know, we moved on, we got into different gigs and I ran into a series of uh, people who really did not get that that was what I was. And they were like, oh no. And when I started hearing the, oh no's, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Cause uh, you know, you, and it's, you know, well, but the profit lot, you know, that's good. No, it's a little experiment. It's good. You know, I'll take it out of this other budget. See, that's the other thing that's really handy is I'm actually good at math. <laughs> right. Uh, so um, I, w- uh, I would do these experiments that um, I would run the numbers before I did them. So I knew I wasn't breaking the bank. I okay. knew where the money was coming from. And when I started running into uh, my last job before I, I, um, started out on my own, I actually started an advertising agency inside the company that was doing work for outside clients. Hmm. And I was offsetting because the company was sliding into bankruptcy. I was offsetting the salary so I didn't have to fire my people. And it worked. I I mean, it, it worked until someone in management said, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, then I have to lay off these people. And they're like, well, then you have to lay off these people. I said, well, you better put my name on the list. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause I, I was at that moment, I was like, I'm done right. <laughs> because, you know, that was sort of the last indication that this was a creative idea. This was working. So I loved the corporate experience. It really helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, I hated stepping over the brick walls and chain fences, but I did learn. Absolutely. And I went off to start my own business. Fantastic. Also, also. Now, you went off to start your own business. Were you very clear as to what kind of business you wanted to build? What that looked like? Where you're going to start from? Like, how did that even come about? Oh, I knew exactly the business I wanted to run. <laughs> it is not the business I ran. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, so what happened there? Okay. So I... um. 
Uh, one of the things when I was in corporate, I ran a program uh, for our sales channel for the independent people that sold our product. It was a uh, business plan program. So we taught small business owners how to write business plans. So I took the business plan and I wrote this plan. I was going to, the thing I was really good at was building high performance teams, going into organizations that were broken and looking at what's going wrong and figuring out how to realign and turn these teams around. And I had done it several times. And so I was pretty confident that I could teach other people to do that. And that was my business model. Ah, interesting. Yeah, great. Um, except <laughs> in 2002, when I did that, yeah. the economy was such that there were more people than jobs, not like today. So if you had more people, if somebody wasn't happy, if they weren't performing like a team player, you didn't fix them, you fired them, you got somebody else. Why would you spend any money on team building? Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So while I was trying to sell that, people kept calling me saying, hey, Lorraine, I know you used to do marketing. I know this isn't what you do, but could you help me? Okay. And one morning I woke up and I went, oh, mm. I have a marketing company. Yeah. <laughs> So wow. um, that, you know, th there was that the, the big mistake there was waiting too long to let go of the other business because oh. it kept dragging me down. I, I'd go to networking events and I didn't know what to talk about because it was like, well, do I talk about the team building or the marketing? Well, I want to talk about team building, but marketing is what. Yeah. Had I just gone to those events and said, I run a marketing company, I'd have gotten more business faster. But so that's, that's where a lot of people kind of fight themselves with, right? There's a business they want to build. It's their passion. They're so excited about mm -hmm. it, but then something else is selling more, mm -hmm. right? The market wants something else, not what you're passionate about. And it's that, what do I do? Do I let go? Do I follow my passion? You know, cause so many coaches out there say, follow your passion, right? Mm -hmm. That's when it, you know, it doesn't turn into work if you follow your passion. So how did you disengage or decide that even though this is your passion, this is what you want to do, what you love to do, that you need to go in a different direction? So two things. Number one, everything I knew about team building, I turned inward and used with the with the folks that worked for me and created so I had a place that I could apply that passion. So I didn't have to let go. Oh, there you go. But um, sometimes you got to figure out if what you're selling is broccoli. And by that, I mean, nobody gets up in the morning and goes, you know what I really want to eat today? I want broccoli. My well, no. <laughs> maybe a veg. Maybe, you know, even my vegetarian friends do not wake up in the morning saying <laughs> broccoli. You know, no, I mean, you know, oh, look, there's broccoli. Yes, I'll have broccoli. But nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want broccoli. Mm -mm. And it's good for you and you should buy it, but you don't want it. And if you are selling something that's broccoli that you're passionate about, you either got to figure out how to really make the broccoli appealing mm -hmm. or recognize that it ain't ever going to happen. And you've got to figure out a different way to channel your energy. Um, I have done startup weekends with uh, where I facilitated startup weekends and I was working with entrepreneurs who were really excited about a technology. And I had somebody say to me, well, yeah, but the tech is great. So you're in marketing, go find a place we can sell it. No, that's not how it works. Right. Get out into the market and figure out what customers need and find a way to use what you love, your skills, your passion to meet those challenges. Absolutely. I love team building, but the other thing is, and you know, you're like, oh my God, the technology has changed over and over again. I'm a geek. <laughs> I actually like playing with <laughs> software and technology and trying to figure out, um, how, you know, how does it work and why does it work? And then more importantly, how do I fit this into? Right. Or do I? And it's okay to say, you know what? Um, 
at Clubhouse. Do you remember that from two or three yep. years ago? It was like a thing for a minute. Yeah, it was. And, it, and um, we got up every Friday morning, my friend Jen and I, and we'd have a Clubhouse chat. And we were talking to four people. And, <laughs> uh, you know, after about six months of this, I'm like, you know, Jen, I love getting up with you in the morning. But I got to tell you, there's, there's, you know, we, we've, we've kind of worked our way through this system. And everybody's telling everybody else how to make a million dollars on on um, Clubhouse. And if they were making a million dollars, they wouldn't still be here. Right. Absolutely. So what we did is we're like, you know what? How do we turn this into something that has some value? And we switched and we do a live chat now. Um, we do it on Facebook and we do it on, uh, we push it to LinkedIn. And and yeah, we push it to Twitter, but <laughs> Um, and, uh, I have a Facebook group and so I pop it in there. So we still have the same conversations. We're having fun, but then we have the recordings and, and I think you, you know, you and I were talking offline. Mm -hmm. We're in a video world. Yes. So now there are snippets. I can go back to conversations we've had before. When we go on vacation, shh, don't tell me that. we pre-record and we make it look like we're live. But we're not. There you go. There you go. Right. All well, the magic that you can do on video mm-hmm. is, is insane, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're there to wait to connect with our audience, right? To build those relationships, to, to find out what it is that they want, because we're there to serve them at the end of the day, mm-hmm. right? So that's awesome. Now, I want to go back slightly because you mentioned earlier on, right? You doesn't matter what platform you are, what marketing you're doing. There's five basic strategies, right? Yeah. And I would love for you to go through what those strategies are and what that looks like. So number one, who is your customer? I, I, I mean, and I don't even know if I, if I use the word five, if I did, okay. But number one, who is your customer, okay? What do they want? What is What is their issue, okay? The second thing is, Figuring out what you're going to offer, create, produce, sell that is going to meet that specific customer. And the third thing that you really have to think about and be able to verbalize because, oh, you know what? Small business owners need websites. I'm going to build a website. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Small business owners need affordable websites. I'm going to build affordable websites even better. You're, you're zoning in. They need websites that don't have a lot of features. Good. Cause I, I don't have great tech skills, so I'm not going to do a lot of features. So mm-hmm. you've got one and two down. The key is the third piece. Why you, what makes you uniquely qualified? What is your competitive advantage? What is your unique differentiator? And that's where a lot of coaches and business owners, uh, small business owners stop. Well, I empower women to do whatever. Great. There, I, I, I'm looking on LinkedIn. There, there are 200 coaches with that exact descriptor. Yeah. What is it that makes you uniquely qualified? And we we boiled it down to a few things when we ran the agency. One was we really felt that our personal touch was a huge differentiator and we lived it. We didn't just say it. If you called the building, phones got answered on the first ring, always. Wow. First ring. And it rang on everybody's desk and whoever grabbed it didn't say, please hold. They were like, okay, cool. What do you need? Oh, well, maybe I can help. Oh, you need Simon. Well, Simon's on the phone. How can I help you? Hmm. There was that personal touch. The other thing that made us different, and we built we built out this differentiation, is we were all about teaching our clients. So a lot of companies wanted to build a website and sell you these very long, big service contracts, we were like, look, we'll do that. We, we can totally do that. But before you sign that, let us teach you. 
Ah. And so we taught clients how to use all the tools. We taught them how to update their websites. And what did they do? We're like, you know what? You go play for a year. And then in a year, call us and we'll come in and dust and polish. We'll put everything back. Yeah. And we'll upgrade your website. And so this was our unique differentiator. We um, we did marketing in plain English. We it We really focused on teaching people how to take control and being there to support them. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it did, you know, it does not work for everybody. The, the folks that um, ultimately bought, cause I sold my company two years ago, the folks that bought my agency, they were really, they were not set up to work the way we were. And so that was a real struggle after they, they, they looked at what we did and thought they could do it. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, there's, there's <laughs> other things here that you, you need to think about. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that was all really, really good stuff. And again, I think people, you're right. People tend to shy away from what makes them unique, what makes them stand out. Right. Because it's so, I think it's just difficult for people to get their head around. They don't know. They're not sure. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you just sound like everybody else out there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So how do you really buckle down and figure out what is your uniqueness, right? What what makes you different to everybody else? Well, and different, um, different and better, and or different and better for a, a subset. Okay? okay, what makes you unique? It if you're like you know what we uh, our specialty is women coming out of corporate America that want to start their own business. Okay, great. It's a good segment. Mm -hmm. There are a million people that are doing that. If you want to be unique, you need to focus on a smaller group. Okay. So um, I'll give you an example. Lots of web companies do small business websites. Okay. Mm -hmm. I came out of the heating and air conditioning industry. And so my specialty was home services. Ah. So I, and we did do, and and eventually we expanded to service-based businesses. But if you ask what made us unique, I could say, you know what? We do websites for all sorts of businesses, but we are really good at heating and air conditioning, plumbing, roofing, electricians. So if you have a service-based business, I understand what makes your customers want to buy. Right. I couldn't say that to everybody and have any credibility at all. Mm. But I could in that niche. And so when you answer, why should I buy from you? Because that's really what a position statement is about. The answer has to have its roots in, I understand your world. Ah, oh, I like that. That mm-hmm. is pretty powerful. That is awesome. Now, Lorraine, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the tech world, right? <laughs> and how how it's changed, right? Um, even in the past year, year and a half with, you know, chat GTP and AI. Now, as a marketing agency, mm-hmm. are you for all of this tech that, you know, is revolutionizing businesses apparently right and helping them with their marketing or do you believe that we still need human touch when it comes to all the marketing stuff so i'm uh i'm gonna say several things there number one um ai has been with us for a long time Mm -hmm. it's not been as accessible but it's it's been there so if you're frightened of the technology um you missed that boat you needed to be frightened 20 years ago (laughs) Okay. The second thing is that um, I think I started, well, ChatGPT was introduced in November of 2020. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, I'm teaching a, a, a marketing class this semester. And so professors are absolutely losing their minds because how do you grade papers? Right. And what uh, one of the professors I was talking to said, ChatGPT can take my course. They just can't pass it Ooh. because of the, and, and I think that applies to 
businesses as well. Okay. Um, Chat GPT has its limitations. So what you as a, a business owner or you as a marketer need to do is experiment, but recognize that if you want to sound like everybody else, everybody else, let a robot do your marketing. Mm. Because all chat GPT can do, it is not, it is not a sentient being. It is not capable of original thought. All it can do when you say, write 10 social media status updates for me, for this audience on this topic, it can give you 10 based on the best that it has seen. Right. None of those will be unique to you. Mm, they can't be. Um, I, so I think you use where ChatGPT is at its best is use it as a conversation starter. You're going to laugh. My favorite use, and this ChatGPT is really good at this. I give it the transcripts from my podcast episodes. I started doing this a few weeks ago and I give it the transcript and say, write a three paragraph summary. Oh, it's a, it is original content that doesn't exist anywhere else on the web because it's the result of a conversation that I had with another human being. That's right. Yeah. Summarized yeah. in real time. Now, when I read the summary, do I still have to go in and go, oh, okay, no, wait a minute. I would not say it that way. This is a fine point. You missed it, but it's a great starting point. Um, I sometimes use it if I'm stuck for an introductory paragraph for a blog post. Mm -hmm. But what I find with ChatGPT is that it's informative, but dull, and it is repetitious. It'll say something and then it'll say it again. And the reason it does that, if you understand the algorithm is, you know how like when you start to type a question and Google fills in the blank for you, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's anticipating what it thinks you're going to say. That anticipation is built into the ChatGPT algorithm. So, oh, you want to talk about this. So here we go. And it starts talking and then it comes back to that because it's, it's a machine. So it's good for about a paragraph or two, but then you still have to personalize it. Right. And, um, as I, I, uh, I start teaching tomorrow. And as I'm going to tell my students, not everything on the internet is accurate or true. And ChatGPT does not differentiate. It does not differentiate from a fact-based fact website and a nonsensical, crazy person who's raving. And it right. will assemble those facts and present them to you. It will not prioritize. It will not say, this is the best, this is next, this is next. It can't. It will simply list the information. It's up to you to trust but verify. Right. Check sources. Do not ask ChatGPT to give you its sources. It can't. I did that yesterday. <laughs> I wanted to see if it could write a paper with citations. It can't. Um, and... It is based on information uploaded to the internet through the end of 21. Right. So it is less capable. Now it's learning all the time, but it is less capable uh, of really focusing in on modern things. So I'll leave you with this thought on ChatGPT. I'm a sci-fi geek right. and I love dystopian sci-fi, you know, where the robots take over the world. Mm -hmm. How do human beings, um, win in the end in all those movies, they ultimately have to do something that the machines are not capable of doing. Right. They have to break the rules. They have to be creative and think outside the box. And so that's the same with chat GPT is um, recognize what it is, recognize the constraints. It's not going to put every writer out of business. It's going to force the good writers to get better mm. and create a lot of mediocre ones who are too lazy to learn how to do it well. Interesting. Uh, yeah. 
That is awesome. Oh my goodness, Lorraine, the amount of golden nuggets you've just dropped in this short <laughs> amount of time. I feel like I can speak to you forever. It was all really powerful stuff. Now, I know at this point, people are thinking, oh my goodness, I need to connect with Lorraine. I need to speak with her. I need her working with me right now. So where can they go to connect with you? So um, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Lorraine Ball, you'll find me. Um, my podcast, More Than A Few Words. And um, if you really want to uh, brainstorm for an hour, um, I have to switch the page up, but it'll be back on my website. Uh, you can book an hour, office hours, we can talk. And um, you set the topic and we'll we'll talk about your business and how you can get better. Oh, that is awesome. So generous of you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you for coming on to the show. And wow, my mind is blown. Thank you for all the golden <laughs> nuggets. My pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Right. I knew this was going to be an epic episode and it absolutely was. I'd love to have you back on the show. Like we can talk forever on this. It's amazing. <laughs> that would be fun too. For sure. Well, once again, thank you for coming to the show and being so generous with your information. Thanks for listening to Make Your Mark podcast at www.makeyourmarkpodcast.com. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get this and every other episode that comes out. We have lots of great stuff coming, so make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss it. And thank you in advance for all the reviews and comments. I appreciate it so much. And I look forward to serving you in next week's episode.